Appreciate that good testimony of what the Word of God can get done. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's the power of God and the salvation. Whosoever believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, to the Greek. Boy, it's good to know His Word. Peter promised uh, concerning the Lord Jesus. He's not slack concerning His promise, but He's long-suffering towards us, but not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. The Word is important. The reason it's important because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Okay? And the Bible says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld uh, His glory. The, only, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. Uh, there's no salvation without this right here. It's the most important thing we have. I've got just a few minutes. I've got a, my usual 35, 40 minute sermon. I don't know if you've ever heard a Baptist preacher take 45 minutes and turn it into five minutes. No, you haven't. I'll <laughs> go ahead and answer that for you. It just don't happen. So uh, I'm going to try to uh, introduce this and we'll come back tonight and finish it. But I feel like uh, after Brother Dow spoke, I feel like I was on the right track this morning. And uh, so I just want to share a few minutes. Uh, just a few minutes. Is that okay with you? Let me share just a few minutes. Let me just do my introduction. Maybe I'll start doing that. My introduction on Sunday morning and my sermon on Sunday night. So you have to come back tonight to hear the rest of it. So uh, if you don't come back, I'll figure you didn't care much for the introduction. <laughs> you just decided not to come back. I'd like to take the Word of God and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be reading verses 1 through 7. Verses 1 through 7. Chapter 2 uh, is full of analogies. Uh, there's six or seven analogies, illustrations that God uses to describe the Christian and his work, his ministry, his warfare. His, uh, it's unusual in that um, it's the last known letter, known writing uh, that we have of this great apostle. Uh, he is in a Roman prison, uh, he will soon be executed. Uh, and the Lord uh, of glory, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, begins to work uh, as he's there in prison and begins to move his hand and, and to write the inspired word here that he gives to uh, a young preacher boy, uh, uh, like a son to him, uh, Timothy. And so this book is full of love, it's full of encouragement, but it's also full of warnings and instructions. Uh, and I just want to look at the three analogies, uh, and we'll probably touch on some of those uh, Again, get to in more detail tonight, uh, but I just want to introduce some things to you. Again, these analogies here, uh, we'll find three of them in the first uh, seven verses. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy is right after 1 Timothy. And that's so corny, isn't it? I know y'all get tired of me using that, but those are, I like to preach out of the second or first book because that goes right on. Joke, so. <laughs> now therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also thou therefore endure hardness as a good what? Soldier. a good soldier as your first analogy a good soldier of Jesus Christ no man that warreth entangling himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him or enlisted him to be a soldier. Now verse 5 says, If a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. There's a second analogy. It's the analogy of an athlete. The word strive there is the word atleto. It's the Greek word we get athletics from or athletes from. The word strive there. And so there's an analogy there of an athlete. And Paul would have been very familiar with athletes at that time. The biggest games that people came from all over the world to watch was the Ithema Games. And the Ithema Games were right outside of Corinth. And so Paul spent a lot of time there. He would have known those games. They were bigger in that day than the Olympics. Uh, and, of course, the Olympics were going on at that time. But these games were even bigger uh, than that in that day. And then verse 6, the husbandman, there's your third analogy. The husbandman, that's a, that's a farmer. The word there is the Greek word for a tiller of the ground. One that plows the ground. And so your third analogy, uh, there is a farmer. In verse 7 it says, Consider 
what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now Paul introduces here uh, these analogies, but in verses 1 and 2, he gives us the purpose and the power for the ministry of God, the purpose and the power to fulfill these uh, duties uh, as the soldier, as a good soldier, as the great athlete, and as the, the patient and hardworking uh, laborous father. And so Paul uh, here tells Timothy, he says, I want you to take the Word of God, the things that you have heard of me by many witnesses, and I want you uh, to commit that to faithful men who teach others also. The word commit there is an important word because it's a bank term that was used in that day. It meant to deposit something, something very valuable, something very present, uh, precious, deposit that into someone or some bank or some place that you had complete confidence in in. In other words, you would take the most precious thing you have uh, like we do today, and we deposit that, just like we make a deposit in the bank, and we put that precious uh, deposit and we place it in some place that's secure, some place we can trust, some place that is trustworthy, and what he's telling them is, I want you to take the Word of God that you've seen me and heard of me preach uh, by many witnesses, and I want you to deposit that into someone else's life. That's what your life comes down to. What are you committing to other men, other women? What are you? How are you investing and committing and depositing yourself into somebody else's life in order to make a difference? Paul doesn't suggest that. He doesn't recommend it. He commands it. Hey, listen, you can make a difference. You can deposit something in somebody's life at work. And he says, I want you to commit that faithful word not only at work, but I, you can do it at home. I'm going to start preaching now. <laughs> Listen, you can deposit all the video games, the TVs, and the radios, and the good times, and all, the, all this you can do for your kids. And listen, I'm the same way. I want the very best. When I'm not beating them, I want the very best for my kids. You can ask who from that. I do anything for them. I want them to get the best education. I want them to have the best of everything. All parents are like that. But if you're not depositing the things of God into their life, you're not obeying the Word of God. This Amen. Morning. There's nothing more important that you can do than to invest and deposit the Word of God in your life that you're living that's godly before them that they can see your epistle written on their hearts. Nobody knows us like our family knows us. That's right. I wonder how many times your kids seen you drop to your knees and you deposit that, that life of prayer into their lives. How many times do your kids see, look, uh, you're faithful to come through the doors of the house of God when it's open. And you deposit in that, that, you're taking that faithfulness and that commitment and your deposit. Listen, your kids know if you're faithful or not. They know. Your wife knows. People know. And nobody knows it's like our family does. They know if it's real in your life or is it just something you do. They know. Your kids know all about you. You kids don't be saying nothing about me. <laughs> but you shouldn't be saying much daddy. They know. They know. What are you committing at home? What are you committing to your family? What, are you com what, what person, uh, or, listen young uh, ladies, uh, you need someone, uh, some uh, Titus woman, like Andrew preached the other evening, uh, some Titus woman, some Proverbs 31 woman to pull you alongside and say, I want to deposit you some of what I've learned from the Lord, uh, how I live my life godly before others, and I want to take you and put you under my arm, and I want to deposit those things and commit those things, and I want you to be faithful. Because listen, if we don't do that, and men, if you don't do that, then it stops with you. Mm -hmm. That's what's wrong today. Somewhere along the line, there was a generation that just said, you know what, we're going to go to heaven. and we're to... Listen, today's generation comes from the generation before. Don't you point your finger at the next generation because they just came from us. And the next generation will come from them. And listen, you, we need to take some responsibility on how we're committing things, depositing our treasures in other people's lives. How are you doing that? Notice the word witness. Paul said, I've done this before many witnesses in that verse too. 
That's a neat word. I, I love that word because A.T. Robertson in his Greek word studies uh, uh, says that that's a legal term that was used in that day. In other words, it was the same legal term that we use today for a witness in a court of law that stands. And they stand. You know what you do when you're a witness or when you're in the jury or something? Anybody have jury duty or something like that? And the witness would come and he would place his hand on the Bible. That's how they do it today. You know. And they, they get you to uh, say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that's what this word is. In other words, a witness is not a spectator. He's a testifier. You can witness something. You can see something going on in somebody's life. And listen, and, and, and you can shut the door. Or you can do like when people, you know how you do when you see something you don't want to see out in public or something. You see the, the bum on the street. You know how you do. You just pick up and start walking fast. And I don't see that at all. Right? They're waiting at the light and you, you just run the red light so you don't have to stop there. Right? You see, you witness something, but you're not testifying. Also, you got, you see, listen, there's witnesses. A witness has to be a witness. A witness, if you're going to be able to witness to somebody, you have to be a witness first. Listen, you need to be a testifier. He said, it's not just enough to suck up all of God's blessings. But you need to be a testifier. Mm -hmm. It's not enough for you to see God in somebody else's life and to witness it, but you need to be able to testify of that in your own life. It's a strong word of that. God help us to be more than spectators. You know, spectators make very little difference in life. You notice that? I mean, I like, you know, I've been doing these, Jeff, I've been doing these sports analogies like, oh, I just can't get off of it because I like sports. And, 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 I like, and, and since I can't play sports, I have to be a spectator. And I've had very little outcome on the game. In fact, I really have no outcome on the game. It's who's on the field that really has the outcome of the game. Really. And see, they're the ones that are making the difference. The spectators are just blowing money on the ticket. Getting a little enjoyment. But the victory is down on the field. The difference makers are down on the field. They're in the game. They're not spectators. Are you a difference maker? Or are you just a spectator? Spectators, I've told you this before. I've gotten on that kick here lately. Because yeah, I've seen plenty of spectators in the church. You know how to spectate. I've told you what they do. The first thing they do, they come up to you and tell you. Now, if that was me, <laughs> I'd do it. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. I do that to Cooper all the time. When he's doing something. This is how I do it. That means they don't want to do it. They're not going to do it, but they tell you how to do it. They just spectate. You know what? You know, spectators are not making the difference. We need some testifiers. We need somebody in the game. Listen, it's like one preacher I heard say one time, if you want to know how much difference a spectator makes, go home, fill you up a five-gallon bucket full of water, stick your arm down to the bottom, pull it out, and look at the hole you made in there, and that's how much difference you're making. <laughs> Whew, I'm preaching now. <laughs> Let me close. I'm running over. Let me get my introduction out of the way. Before you come back tonight, you're really going to get something. Listen. And then... Paul said, here's the, not only the purpose is to commit thou to faithful men, but he said, here's the power behind it all. He says, be strong. Be strong. Be strong. My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The storehouse of everything that Jesus has his power, our opportunity to boldly come to the throne of grace. Uh, everything in my heartbeat, the reason I can see, the reason I can walk, the storehouse of all the power, all the ability, all the strength of our Lord is wrapped up in His grace to me. It's none of me and all of Him. I can't breathe on my own unless He allows it. I didn't wake up this morning unless He says so. Uh, right. you're nothing that, listen, it's nothing that you're so powerful and strong. Listen, you think you're strong today? Just give it a few years and you're going to wake up like this. Hey. And, man, and you're going to get out of bed and you're going to, oh! It's going to take you a while to get going. Yeah. We're not that strong. We're not strong. We're not anything. It's His grace that is sufficient. 
in your life to give you the power to do this thing. Mm -hmm. you know, I like the word strong there. It's made up of two Greek words, and, and that's not important, but one of them is uh, dynamo. One of them is dynamo. <laughs> it's where we get our word dynamite from. It's an awful dynamite that you ever need to blow something up is in the grace of Jesus Christ. We're just not listen. You blow something up. Mm. Grandpa, uh, you remember that daddy grandpa used to take the dynamite, put it out there on them stumps, mm. and run back to his truck, <laughs> pop the hood, hit remember that? Hit on the back. Pull <coughs> well, right out. If you didn't know what you're doing, that stump would just come back and get right back in the hole. You didn't know what he's doing and flip that. Dynamite's powerful. God's grace, his unmerited favor towards you. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that through His poverty you might be rich. Even when we were dead in sins, He has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. It's not of yourself. And the, the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love which was in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, settle you. What have you done with God's grace? Paul said, I am what I am because of that grace. Yeah. And he said, I labored because of that grace. I labored more than all of them. In other words, he said, I took the grace of God and did all that I could do with it. All that God could work through me through His grace, I've tried to do. Not many of us can say that again. Most of us could say this, though. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of His covenant wherewith He was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You know what he meant there? He said, you know what? Some people just took the grace that God gave them and just stopped it like it was nothing. In other words, the blood of the covenant, everything that God had done for them, uh, they said, that, listen, it's the grace and all that. It's really been all me. And I took the grace of God. And you know what I've done with it? I've, I've done a big fat zero. I've been a spectator when God has given me everything I need to deposit into other people's life. What we're going to preach tonight, I can feel it. Let's rise. Yeah. And if you'll go over here to the piano. And lead us there in our closing hymn, number 816. Have thine own way in your life. Listen. Are you spectating or are you on the field? Have you done all? Can you say that I've done what I could do? I took the grace of God and I've committed it. It's been committed to me by the Lord Jesus Christ and I've committed it to others. Can you say that? Well, I can't. Maybe you're like me in here today and say, you know what? Boy, I took the grace of God and I took it. I took advantage of the grace of God. I hadn't, I hadn't been all that I could be. I haven't committed all that I could commit. God, I, I, I want to just come down here to this altar and humble myself and say, Lord, oh God, help me to commit more to other people. Help me to commit more to my family, the things of God. Help me to be a better brother and sister here at this church. I help me to take someone along my side and say, this is what I've learned about God. And I just want to show you some love from God. I just want to, I, I want you to come under and be my young fella. And I just want to raise up another generation. Listen, uh, don't look at it. Listen, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, what have we done this other generation? I want to be somebody to say, you know what? I've done everything I could. I've done good things. I've been good to my family. But I just, you know what I'm missing? Well, I just ain't been, I mean, you know what? I'm just not committing the things of God to my family. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're lost this morning. Say, you know what? I'm, the, I'm in the grandstand. I've been to church a lot of times. I sit in the pew and I've been a spectator. But I'm ready to get in the games. I need Jesus this morning. I just want to get.
get in the game. Maybe you just want to get in the game this morning. I'd love to share Jesus with you. Because these folks are dealing with the altar. Maybe someone say, you know what? I just want to come pray for the next generation. God help the next generation to stand up. God help them to be strong. God help them to fill the shoes. Look, we, uh, we've had several funerals here. And people we've known the last few weeks. And, and Brother Barry. And, and who's going to fill those the shoes in this next generation? You come. You come. If you need Jesus, you come. Come on. Don't worry about what somebody else is thinking about you. they got more problems than you got. I used to... Hey, well, I used to be like that. Oh, I can't step back. Especially as a preacher, they might think I've done something. I don't care what people think anymore. I just want to please Him. who's called me according to His grace. Don't worry about what they think and they got more problems than you've got. You just come. If you need Jesus, you come. You come. Thanks for coming today. Uh, we'll continue this service tonight, Lord willing. And we'll look at some more of these analogies. Boy, God is so good to us. He's so wonderful to us. I love Him so much. He's just a wonderful Savior. Uh, what a great God, a mighty King. I'm going to ask Pastor Wayne uh, to close us in a word of prayer. And look forward to seeing you tonight. God bless you. Father, thank you for this opportunity to have you come to worship you, lift up your holy name through the testimony of those that are here today to worship you and give you represented. Father, we thank you for that ministry and the lives that it's touched and changed your holy word. And Father, we're thankful to, to hear your word preached here and lived out here through this church. And Father, I ask that you continue to bless Pastor Fred, his family, and his church as they endeavor, endeavor to complete your call, Father, that you have on your life each and every day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.